we, we never know our own intrinsic value. We never grasp who we are ourselves. If, if, the, if the devil can beat us anywhere, it is in our ability to see the gifts that God has put inside us and the gifts that God has given us. And here you are, a tomboy, um, you know, obviously by all the swimming that you did, you know, fabulous condition. And you're thinking, you know, I'm just going to be a, a regular girl in college. And someone comes along and says, no, yeah. no, you have, you've got the it factor. So what kind of change, <laughs> what kind of mind-blowing um, world? You must have gone from just in, in a world of wondering what to do into this octane, high octane world of, of fashion. How did that? Yeah. Uh, I spent a lot of time. Well, my first job was in Rome and then flying to Paris to do the collections for Italian Bazaar. And um, so I didn't even know what Haute Couture was at the time. And fly into Rome and within four days I had the cover of the magazine. Oh. So um, there's a long, I mean, there's a lot of backstory, but I think that God knew that he had to put me and make me work, uh, make me high up quickly. I had a cover of an American magazine in a couple months. And then I also had a national makeup ad. So things moved very quickly for me. Otherwise I would have gone back to college. I would have said, forget this. So I spent a lot of time crying. Um, I spent a lot of time running back to my parents and trying to live my straddle my life, part of it that way. And part of it in New York and, then slowly I started looking at all my old friends from high school and I'm like, hmm, they're not dressing well and they're kind of getting fat. And I got this critical attitude, which is very um, prevalent in New York City for in fashion. And um, so not that I was better than other people, but I just thought I could help them, <laughs> help them to dress, help them how they how they looked. Um, and I came from my value system growing up was good grades, fast swimming times and being a good kid for my parents. When you go to New York City, who cares if you got a fast swim time? Who cares if you were an A student? They don't. It was all external. So that changing from um, performance based to uh, the physical, you know, was was a different um, strange thing. And then I had to battle, okay, who is Kim really? And what does Kim want? Because I spent a lot of time being upset and not understanding a lot of the people I worked with yet. I'm working, working, working. I had up to 14 hour, 14 jobs a day, 14 job offers every day. Sometimes I would do three covers of magazines in one day. So I would work from nine to one, one to five and five to nine and do three covers for magazines. I would have eight oh, covers in one month. Right. So it was one of those things where um, success was just very quick. I didn't seek it. I didn't want it. Uh, and it was dumped in my lap. And so then I had to learn how to handle it. And I'm still growing up. I didn't know who I was or what I wanted. So there was a lot of nights of trying to figure things out, making some bad choices, other ways I, I I must have had some inner strength to be able to say no to a lot of situations. Sure. And um, it was just, it was a real learning experience. That's incredible. How, and how does a girl, a young girl, keep any kind of balance in, in your life when everything is so superficial? It's all on how you look, you know, and, and, and your appearance. How do you keep yourself balanced or don't you? Does, does the whole thing just sweep you along? I think that I, I, I kept trying to figure out what made Kim happy. And one way was for me to rebel, which meant no makeup um, and wear sweatpants, sweat, sweatshirts, jeans, and a pearl, a, a strand of pearls. So I would go around with my hair in a ponytail and because they were going to put on my hair and makeup anyway. So yeah. I didn't want to fuss. I hardly even wanted to brush my hair because your hair starts to hurt by the end of the day. <laughs> so um, I just was trying to figure out what made me happy. And I didn't seek God right away, even though I'd been an elder at the age of 17 and back home. Um, but I started working out again and started swimming and running and just found that I could um, just, I don't know, just disconnect for a while. Get a release, yeah. Yeah. 
And then as I got older, I realized that I was much happier when I would give to others versus taking. So, you know, when you, I find when you're depressed, when you're not feeling well or good about yourself, go out and help someone else. Absolutely. Don't wallow in your own stuff. Yeah. Well, that, that is, so <laughs> years, years of, of blinding success. Um, Kathy Ireland was one of the other supermodels. There's a whole list of you guys that kind of floated above everybody else. And um, maybe half a dozen of, of, of supermodels went into this stratosphere that I don't think anyone had ever seen before. But everything in life changes and age comes along. And so how do you transition out of the runway and the, the swimsuit modeling and all that stuff? How do you change when, when time comes along and you're, you know, that, that is no yeah. longer part and, of your future? And now I have no college degree, right? So I, um, I decided to sign with William Morris years ago. And one of the first things they did was have me go on an interview at Good Morning America. So I sat down and talked to this wonderful woman at Good Morning America and talked for whatever. And all of a sudden she said, so do you want the job? And I said, what job? <laughs> she says, fashion editor of, of Good Morning America. And I said, okay, well, I'm not sure how much I know about fashion, even though I was around it all the time. Yeah. Um, and she says, good, you're live on the air tomorrow at 7.43. And I'm like, oh my wait, gosh. what? <laughs> so I dove into broadcasting. I'd been doing some in Florida. At that point, I was living in Florida and traveling every single week back and forth. And I had two health clubs. So I was on the local news station to try and generate business by giving fitness tips. So um, all of a sudden, I'm plunked from little tiny Jacksonville, Florida into... <laughs> Good morning, America. Back I'm watching Charlie get live and let's see the light come on. I'm like, that means we're live and millions of people are watching right now. So had to figure out new tricks. You just always have to learn something new. And if opportunities come up, give it a try. Isn't that true? I, I've, in my life, I've discovered that the greatest opportunities I've had for ministry has come when I'm least expecting it. The more you strive for something, Sometimes, you know, when you're in a swimming pool and there's a ball in front of you and you try and splash and you try and find it. And what happens is you actually push it away from you rather than let it come to you. And sometimes right. we're so anxious in our lives that we think that we've got to do it all. And we've got to be the, we've got to be the driving force. And, and most times God's waiting for you to stop struggling and stop trying and stop forcing the thing to say to you, listen, be still and know that I am God. Yeah. We yeah. live in this, this driven world that we've got to prove ourselves all the time. And the fact of the matter is that all the proof that was needed was done on that cross. And when we understand yeah. that His will, when I look back over my life, and I came to America when I was 13 years of age, 52 years ago, and I, and I sang with my dad and played the accordion. And one day we were in this little ch church in Greenwood, Mississippi. And there's a guy on TV, and my dad says, oh, I know him, that's Jim Baker. And I said, well, tell him you're, you're praying. He was on a telephone, tell him you're praying for him. Oh, he won't remember us. What had happened was we had gone to his studio when he and Pat Robertson, Jim Baker started the 700 Club. I don't know if people know that, most folk don't. But the 700 Club oh, yeah. began by Jim Baker looking for 700 people to give $10 a month. That was what, that's where the name come from, the 700 Club. And um, they're doing a telethon, and we showed up 15 minutes to the end of the day, quarter of 11 at night. They were finished at 11. And um, they says, who are you? We're Scottish, and you know, we, we, we write some praise songs. Never heard of praise songs in those days. And they began to sing, and the Holy Ghost fell. And they were on TV till 5 o'clock the next morning. And 300 oh, wow. folk walked to the studio and gave their hearts to Jesus. That oh, was the backstory. So here we are years later in Green Room, Mississippi, and this guy's on the air, and I said, call him and tell me you're praying for him. But that's all he won't remember us. So I called as Simon Cameron. I said, this is Simon Cameron. We just want you to know that we're praying for you. And he came on the air. He said, Simon Cameron, I know you're watching me just now. You better get a hold of me right this minute, or I'll never talk to you until Jesus comes back. And the next day, we were on nationwide television. We couldn't have, we couldn't have engineered that by ourselves. Because God yeah. has a plan. And, and Kim, a lot of folk are watching and some are pastors and some are housewives and they're trying to do stuff. And the Lord is using Kim Alexis to tell you something 
that God's plan is complete and he is working all things together according to his counsel, his wisdom. And you've got to get yes. your, you've got to take your hands off the situation, whatever it is that you're fighting over right now and say, Lord Jesus, you, Jesus, take the wheel to quote that song.